Hey everybody and welcome to Let's Look at Discourse. Discourse is a choose-your-own-adventure-style graphical adventure game. It's not a, a visual novel in the vein of something, you know, like a Katawa Shujo. I, I don't know, again, I fuck up the pronunciation of that every single time and I apologize. Uh, or like, you know, a Cherry Tree High Comedy Club or something like that, or Long Live the Queen. It's more of like a, I don't want to call it Telltale inspired because I don't necessarily know if that's the case, but from a gameplay perspective, it's most similar to like a one-off episode of a Telltale production, you know, like The Walking Dead or Game of Thrones, Tales from the Borderlands, Wolf Among Us, etc, etc. Uh, this is uh, from Alchemy Games, previously more well known for uh, some mobile titles, and some of which eventually made it to the PC. Jack Lumber, for example. Smuggled Truck, which came out on Steam as Snuggle Truck, like, six months after that. Uh, those are a couple of years old at this point. This is what they've been working on, amongst other things, since then. And they did a Kickstarter for Discourse back in November 2013. And if I remember, it made something like $45,000. Here we are! Discourse is out. It is, uh, $15 USD, $17 Canadian with a digital edition available for $10 more than whatever that asking price is. Includes a soundtrack with, uh, a ridiculous number of songs. 77 songs on it, as well as a digital art book and, like, a mini documentary about the making of the game. Without further ado, let's get started here. Uh, I have played this through twice now in about an hour and a half. I'd say if you're if you're going if you're a quick reader, if you're going through the text pretty quickly, you're probably looking at about 35 to 45 minutes per playthrough. It's a game that's designed to be played through multiple times. Uh, there is a DLC story coming soon, by the way, and I don't know if that's going to be a paid DLC or free, but it, it's the kind of thing that I will revisit a game for because it's just so ridiculous. Basically, it, it's a survival kind of game. It's a game where, where, you know, you are worried about trying to survive on a desert island, basically. Uh, the DLC story is gonna actually have, like, indie developers in it, like Tim Schafer, Edmund McMillan, Rami Ismail from Vlam Bear, and uh, a, a bunch of other people, like Ron Carmel from uh, 2D Boy, who did World of Goo. That was one of the stretch goals of their Kickstarter, I think, and it, it it got uh, reached, if I remember correctly, so that is is coming soon, and that's going to be hilarious and ridiculous. Just kind of a shortcut to emerging gameplay to be like, oh, Edmund McMillan just died, alright. So, uh, when you play the game, you play as Rita, she is a 25, I'm assuming this is happening, you know, in the in the present day, she's a 25-year-old female. Uh, she is a barista slash artist who graduated from university recently and is employed as a basically a barista, as mentioned. We're gonna start a new game, it'll discard our previous game save, and uh, it's a very simple game from controls, you can use keyboard and or, you know, uh, Xbox 360 controller, or probably any controller here. Now this is a pseudo-procedurally generated choose-your-own-adventure game. It's meant to be played through multiple times, but I'll admit that still, this is a relatively high asking price for a game that I really doubt too many people are gonna get more than a few plays out of, which is not to say it's not worth the money, but you have to weigh that yourself if you're the kind of person who's a little bit more of a value-oriented player. By the way, there will be spoilers over the course of this video. I'm not gonna play through a whole game, because I think that would ruin a lot of the experience, but I'll probably play through maybe like 30% of one playthrough, so you can see what's going on. Um, basically, when the game starts, we have had a, uh, we've, we've been in a plane crash, unfortunately. You can see it's got this cool kind of like, almost paper crafty, vector style art. I don't know if that, I'm not an art, artist, artiste, or an art, you know, uh, history major or anything like that. Um, so I'm just doing my best. But it's a little paper crafty style, kind of the colorful stuff that, uh, Alchemy was known for in the past as well. Good thing I wasn't in that seat. I'll be also reading a lot of the on-screen text here. If you are uh, annoyed by that, then you should turn back now. There's a lot of reading that happens in the game, and a uh, very limited amount of voice acting. Just kind of grunts and like, Arr! stuff like that. Alright, so we're going to pick up our trusty frying pan here. What the heck was a frying pan doing on a plane? And then we're going to get introduced to our first two uh, team members here. We'll go investigate. Again, the, the comparisons to The Walking Dead are definitely... Uh, apparent here. The choices that you make in the game will have an impact on what you're able to do in the late game. Like, for example, here we've got a little bit of a dilemma. We got Teddy and we got Steve, and they are both uh, totally surrounded by crabs. This is a game that is, although it's uh, macabre and a lot of, like, you know, again, mild spoilers, a lot of terrible things are gonna end up happening to these people, it's got kind of a cartoony aesthetic and a, a bit of a silly kind of vibe to it. Uh, it doesn't actually stop the game from having that much gravitas, but it doesn't necessarily seem like it takes itself that seriously. But there's still been some times where I've been like, oh, that's really sad what just happened right there. So, um... I mean, obviously, it's an absurd situation that we got three crabs over here, and then they're like two grown men are completely afraid of them. But anyway, um, we we have our first choice right here from the game uh, from the game's outset. Uh, let's say, uh, how does this even happen? 
Teddy thought it would be a good idea to wander off to the beach. We do ours, we do something ourselves, but we're afraid to make any sudden movements. Besides, all I have on me is the stupid stapler from my office. I've got my trusty metal detector on me, but they'll definitely attack if I pull it out. Just get over here and help me. What no come here? So we can only really choose uh, one person to save, and I'm gonna go save Steve here. Uh, and I will uh, scare the crabs by swinging the frying pan. I do believe that every uh, outcome has a, or every choice has a set outcome. For example, in this specific choice here, you can see how the game would branch out a little bit. If you attack the crabs with the frying pan, it actually just angers them, and then the person that is nearest to you is going to get hurt by the crabs. If you scare them away by swinging the frying pan, then they all go towards the other person, and the other person is going to end up wounded. I don't think there's really any way to get out of this situation with nobody ended up being wounded. It's a game about trade-offs, and the trade-offs are always going to be two bad choices. You, you kind of have to pick the best of the worst case scenarios. So Teddy says my legs are all torn up, this isn't good. It's a little subtle, but if you actually look at the players, or look at the characters as you play the game, there are visual indicators of their condition. You know, as they get hungrier, as they get more injured, as they go through like personal trials, they'll get more disheveled. And you can judge them almost in like a gods will be watching kind of way. You can judge their condition just by looking at them. Like right now, Teddy's legs look all banged up, man. That's gonna mean that uh, when it comes to later th like things like allocating jobs, Teddy's gonna be like, well, I'm not really feeling up to going out to scavenging for food right now because my legs are all torn up. So it, it is, again, a, uh, a pretty short experience if you play it all through in one sitting at least, but the uh, decisions that you make do have uh, pretty serious implications and consequences that'll happen. And the two runs that I've had have been very different, by the way, but they've been very different because I have kind of self-policed myself and forced myself to take different solutions not just to get all the achievements and stuff like that but actually to just to see you know for my own personal interest how the game changes depending on what you do even if you're making some decisions that are basically suboptimal wait there are other survivors yes they're further inland I'm Steve by the way my name is Teddy alright let's get going so that was pretty much I wouldn't call it necessarily the tutorial but it's kinda of like the open vignette we'll talk or the opening vignette I'll talk to Steve and We'll go back to the camp here. Now the game takes place, it, it doesn't really have a day or a night cycle kind of thing going on, but basically for, for the first little bit of the game, you're going to choose one thing to do during the day, one action to do during the day, and then at night you'll get a chance to talk to your party a little bit and, and see what's going on and try to keep them together. It's it's not as gods will be watching as you might think based on that description of it, but there are some elements of that that I think that, you know the comparison is definitely not completely unfounded. All right, so we're uh, getting introduced to the rest of our party here, and we're kind of the de facto leader right off the bat here, which is a little weird considering they've been around for a while. So we got a few archetypes here. Uh, I'll just introduce them. We got Steve on the far right. He's like your Ed, Ed Norton in Fight Club type character who's disgruntled at his job, uh, was on the plane crash basically to get a vacation uh, that was mandated because he threw a stapler at his boss. Then you got Jolene. Jolene is a nice kind of hardy old lady. She works on a farm with her husband George, who is the mustachioed guy on the far left. May there may or may not be a deeper thing going on there that you can discover yourself depending on the path that you take through the game. Teddy is to my left. He is a neurotic conspiracy theorist who was convinced that the government has crashed the plane and put us here as a test. And uh, then George, and then you've got Garrett in the bottom left, who is your very typical kind of like gamer who's like, you know, I oh I hope I can hit level two so I can help the party survive. You know, the characters they're painted with a pretty broad brush, but you can still get attached to them if you let yourself. And uh, you know, with, they all seem like relatively good people when, when bad things happen to them it feels bad um, so yeah I think I'm feeling okay that's good none of us seem to have been injured in the crash what's your name Rita I'm Jolene that lump over there with the mustache that's my husband George online I'm known as Nebulord 90 but you can call me Garrett all he's been doing is playing games on his stupid handheld video machine it's a, a knock I think at the game uh, boy which is pretty much indestructible all we really know is that we're on an island. We have no clue what kind of stuff could be on the other side. There's a mountain off in the distance, but it's a long hike away. We have no idea what's over there. I got this fire building got started on some shelter. So far, all we've got for food is a pile of pretzels from off of the plane. And then we get introduced to our first bit of conflict here. There is a boar that comes in and steals a few of our pretzels. Jeez Louise and sweet cream cheese. Oh no, those pretzels are our only food. Oh darn, those are going to be such a well-balanced meal for us. I think he's being sarcastic. What if there are more of those pig monsters out there? Rita, you come with George and me. Let's get this boar. Uh, I don't think that's the best idea. It's not like we have weapons to hunt them. My Georgie has his old fishing pole. He can swap them with that. And I suppose you're going to throw that bulky camera of yours at him. Well, I'll do what needs to be done. So this is the framing for what is basically 
uh, beyond like walking around and gathering stuff, which you do on occasion as well, this is the framing for the basic gameplay mechanic of discourse, which is essentially choice. Some people in the party want to do thing X, they think it's best for their survival. Some people in the party want to do thing Y, it's best for their survival. As kind of the de facto leader of the group, you make your decision, and the decisions that you make will have implications not only for the group that you go with, but the group that is left behind, or the group that does the thing that you didn't help them with, if that makes sense. So here we have a decision. Jolene wants to hunt the boar to get our pretzels back, and everybody, well, many other people want to stay here and defend the few resources that we've got left, as Teddy says. So I'm going to skip along through uh, some of this dialogue, and I'm going to say, uh, yes, let's go after it. So I'm going to go after the boar. I've done both um, both of the uh, kind of ways that you can do this. Like, I've stayed behind and I've gone after them. And I'll just, like, illuminate for you what happens, just so you can get an idea of the kind of ripples of choice that you get in Discourse. If you go and hunt the boar, you can kill the boar, bring it back for meat. There may or may not be a you know, deeper twist there. If you stay and defend, you can keep your stuff from being uh, taken by more boars. Some of your party might get injured, and George and Jolene are not going to be good enough to get the boar back. Now, that's what happened the two times that I did it. So you actually have like a, a pretty decent impact on what actually happens. However, uh, I, I don't know to what degree the game is actually procedurally generated, to what degree outcomes are not set and instead are weighted. Uh, like, maybe if I did it this time, George and Jolene could get the boar by themselves? I actually don't know. My assumption thus far has been that the outcome is set, depending on what action you take. But anyway, uh, we're gonna go with the boar, or go hunt the boar, and I'm gonna say, don't worry, you'll be fine. What are we supposed to do if something attacks us here? Um, defend the camp at all costs. If you all work together, you'll have no problem defending the camp. Look, it's just a couple of boars that one dude from Survivor Season 2 totally managed to kill one by himself. Then he fell head first into a fire and had to be airlifted away, but still, man. Alright, so here's our boar. There actually is a little bit of, like, very, very light puzzling in the game. And I would describe it almost as the same kind of puzzling if you're familiar with South Park, The Stick of Truth. Like, it's, it's very, very simplistic and minimalistic. It's not really a defining characteristic of the game, but it is kind of a nice little bit of variety when it shows up. So we need to be careful or it'll run away again. Maybe I can stun it with my camera flash. I've got my trusty fishing pole. Too bad it broke in the crash. I might be able to hit him with it. All right, so what's the plan? So we got to come up with an order that we will actually be able to get this boar taken out. So we might say, you know, tell Jolene to flash her camera because she said that might stun the boar. Jolene, fa flash the boar with your camera. Maybe you will stun it. Flashing the camera when it's looking away isn't a good idea, so she's kind of tutorializing it for us here, so we'll say you're probably right. Uh, I'm going to tell George to throw his fishing pole. This thing is weighted kind of goofy, I don't know how well it's going to work. I'm just going to say, just do it, George. Alright, here we go. He managed to hit the boar, and then we get almost like a Walking Dead style, um, you know, timed encounter here, where I can say, have Jolene flash her camera, and everything slows down. She flashes the boar, the boar's going to get flashed, and then uh, I'm going to attack it with a frying pan myself. And that should make it easy enough to finish off. Alright, I haven't seen a deader boar in all my life. Well, let's get our spoils back to the camp. Uh, I'm going to take the pretzels. They're going to take the boar. And I'm actually interested to see if there's a variable outcome that can happen with this boar here. We'll talk to Jolene to go to the next section. So this is what it's all about. It's really like you can't do it. The reason it's replayable and the reason it's not um, completely ridiculous that the game costs $15 despite being quote-unquote 45 minutes long is because... You really, there's no way to do like a completionist playthrough in one try. You have to play through multiple tries if you're interested and get those varying paths. And I know that's the kind of thing that's not interesting to everybody, so you should know what kind of person you are before you get invested in here. Um, but it was interesting to play through two different styles. I, I don't know if I would do it more, like I still have not gotten like all of the endings, but uh, it, it's still, it was fun to play through twice, for sure. Uh, it, even if the second playthrough, like the first playthrough I was engaged, the second playthrough was more like, well, here's what I would do in this situation, but I'm going to do the opposite so that I can see the alternate kind of paths that, that end up coming. You know, I, you can make some suboptimal decisions on purpose. All right, um, these guys are not looking so good. What happened here? Um, yeah, you can see that um, Garrett's been wounded across his stomach there. There was definitely more than just one boar. More boars showed up, we needed everyone here. You shouldn't have listened to Jolene, we needed to stay together, Rita. It was like they have a hive mind, it was all part of a bigger plan. The first boar was just a distraction so the others could feast upon our flesh. We tried to defend the camp like you said, but Garrett got slashed up pretty badly. You told us to do this, Rita, we could have all been killed. I'll admit, you know, the writing in the game is mostly pretty good, but sometimes... 
it's laid on a little heavy handed. Like, I mean, maybe this is intentional, but the line like this, like, we, you told us to do this, we could have all been killed, I guess it's designed explicitly to make you feel very guilty. But even if you stay and help them defend the camp, you can do things in the wrong order and Garrett can still get injured. Um, I, I do think it's probably the right, the better decision, the optimal decision of the two, if you will, to not go hunt the boar, because I've never had George and Jolene come back and be injured, but I wanted to do a suboptimal decision just to show it. I maybe could have done more if my legs weren't all cut up from those crabs. What did you want me to do, swing Teddy around my head and beat the boars away? I'm sorry, boys, I couldn't hear you over the sound of sizzling bacon. So the good news is we do have the boar. However, um, I don't know, you guys, I love a good pig roast, but something isn't right here. You can see it's all, like, infested with flies and stuff like that. So this did happen last time. I was interested to check and see if that was something that could change from run to run. But, yeah, the, the meat is diseased. Anything is good to eat if you cook it long enough. That is just pretty much not medically true. George playing the part of the good husband there. Nah, I think this thing's got some bugs. Um, that's pretty cool. How many or gross? Let's say how many. How many are there? Well, there's a bunch of flies hovering around it. Who knows how many bugs are actually inside of it? Hey, look at that. You can see worms moving around in there. Unbelievable. Yep, it's definitely diseased. Protein is still protein, right? We probably shouldn't eat it. It ain't like we can wait to decide. We should save the pretzels until we absolutely need them. The meat needs to be eaten tonight. Uh, I'm gonna say Garrett's right. We shouldn't eat the meat. We shouldn't eat it. It's not worth the risk. Maybe we can pick them out. Let's just burn it up. We don't want a bunch of worms hanging around our camp. I second that. All right, so there's a there's three possible outcomes here. You can eat the meat. You can say I'm out, but uh, you know you guys do whatever you want. And then Jolene and George will eat the meat. I apologize if it seems like spoilers, but really what I'm trying to do is illustrate the kind of like fractaling out. You know the the arrays of solutions or not solutions, but outcomes that you can get depending on what your dialogue options are. So if you let Jolene and George eat the meat, they may or may not feel shitty the next day and be unable to help you in your tasks basically which can have again a rippling effect on how things go for you in the future steve is going to protect the pretzels which is good but we chose the option that was basically like nobody's going to eat the meat everybody's going to be hungry and as people like it's not really shown on screen outside of like the gradual disheveling that that happens but as people get hungrier they will become weaker and they'll refuse to to go on tasks and stuff like that with you uh, as a result of that hunger so you know, you do have to weigh it, uh, you have to weigh it both ways, and to end the day, at least for the first few days, we grab a torch out here and we, um, wander ourselves over to their makeshift camp, and it's, it's kind of weird, this mechanic is not used as much in the, uh, I mean, at least it's not mandatory, but it's not used as much in the in the later sections of the game. But you can take some time to actually talk to people and see what's going on. So, you know, you, you get to talk to three people here. Let's talk to Steve. Finding you on the beach was a surprise. We were pretty lucky you were there, I guess. Yeah, that was oddly disorienting to wake up to. Yeah, Teddy was looking to find some supplies, and all we found was that horde of crabs and me. Yeah, you may have been better off without this group. We don't bring a whole lot to the table. Um, let's say... I disagree. Let's try to keep morale up. I disagree. I think we make a pretty decent team. You sound like my boss. Groups have never paid off in my experience. Um, alright, so that conversation is over. Let's talk to George. I don't get enough opportunity to talk to George. And he's had some terrible outcomes in the two save files that I've done, so I feel bad. He seems like he's such a nice dude. Why don't you and Jolene sleep next to each other? You two are married, aren't you? Well, Jolene's been complaining about my snoring recently. I want to do like a Frank Underwood voice. Well... Jolene has been complaining about my snoring recently, which is odd because it never used to bother her. Sorry, I guess that's none of my business. Oh no, it's fine. Taking out that board was as easy as pie. It wasn't that easy. It actually wasn't pretty easy, all things considered. Alright, so uh, there's a little bit of flavor text here that I'm skipping, but you'll have to forgive me because the dialogue is you know, one of the principal draws of the game. Uh, let's talk to Garrett here. Virtual reality is pretty advanced these days, though it doesn't hold a torch to these past hours. He's pretty much just a, a big old nerd, basically. Which is fine, he can be very helpful for us. It sucks that his belly got slashed up there. And, uh, again, skipping the flavor text here. Again, part of the reason you're playing this, largely the reason you're playing this, is for the, the interactions between the characters and the dialogue, so I don't necessarily want to spoil it. And I think I've shown off uh, enough of the dialogue to tell you, or at least demonstrate whether or not you've gotten a feel for it. We'll probably play through one more day here, because... In a weird way, it's not like it's not like the kind of game. I'm trying to think of a good example. You know, there are many games where there's kind of like 30 seconds of gameplay that you just recycle over and over and over, and that's not a bad thing. Isaac does that. You know, every room is about 30 seconds long, and it's fun. 
but you it's room 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 boss room 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 item room like that stuff's repeated this is kind of different day to day i've had runs that have lasted nine days i've had runs that have lasted 11 days um and you don't really just do like action in the morning talk to people at night action in the morning talk to people at night it is a little bit more adventurous and it gets into some more novel stuff as the game goes on which i don't necessarily want to spoil but you know later on depending on how things go in the early game you can kind of make a decision which like main quest to go on and that's a bit of a grandiose way of describing it because it does literally end up being like the last 15 minutes of the game but you kind of choose like a final objective and then you have like a sam and frodo style like quest to mount doom basically against all odds accomplish this and hopefully save as many people as you can that's the goal is really to, I mean you can say your own goal I guess but your goal is to save as many people as you can and you get kind of like a cool Walking Dead style like end slate at the end of it with like a newspaper headline that shows you how you did and you know what happened after the game no stats yet though I would love to see a stat screen to see like how people reacted to the major decisions in the game I think that would make it uh, a little bit more engaging as well all right so let's do let's do day two here or whatever I'm ready to get some things done today I don't think you should be doing anything today all you did yesterday was make things more difficult by leaving. You know, you gotta try to keep things copacetic in the group as well, if you can. Alright. It's actually just like caffeine withdrawal is the headache there. But anyway. We're gonna get a, a, an assortment of three different things that we can possibly do here. Uh, we can search for fresh water. We can sign try to signal for help. Or we can um, explore the crash site for some... Uh, for some materials. Now I know what all these outcomes actually are except one, so I'm gonna go with we need some sort of signal. And uh, that will allow, I'm, I mean, I'm skipping over a lot of dialogue here, but uh, a lot of these people are gonna go out and now look for water and look for food themselves, but they'll have less less chance of success. I don't know for sure if they're gonna be successful, but they'll have less chance for success as a result of only having two people instead of the three people that they'd have if I were there. We're kind of the crux of them getting their uh, successful objectives or accomplishing their objectives successfully. I don't think it's gonna work, Rita. Stop goofing around, we need to find a way to connect to the outside world. What if we write something in the sand? Maybe we can get the attention of boats and planes. If we use driftwood to make a signal, it won't wash away as quickly with the tide. Should I go looking for driftwood? Yeah, you go searching for wood and debris. I'll start cleaning up this area for us to write on. Depending on which characters you choose uh, to, to do like their objectives, I don't know if it actually makes you, uh, like it makes them like you more or anything like that, but you kind of get more flavor text about them uh, which naturally leads to you being a little bit more attached to them, which is more uh, horrifying when something terrible does happen to them. Like, usually on my first couple of playthroughs, I didn't pay attention to Teddy at all because he just seems like a like he's crazy. You know, he's off his rocker. Um, but he actually becomes kind of a more sympathetic character if, if you choose him and go on a couple of quests with him. Uh, and and you can have some really cool kind of like interactions with him that I like a lot. I, I really do think that even more so than Telltale games. Um, th this game has some replayability. Now that being said, it, it also doesn't tell kind of as epic of a story or over as long of a period. Uh, but I kind of like that it, it just boils the games down to the rapid fire choices and you're like bang bang bang, you know, I can play through a run in 45 minutes and see all the possible outcomes uh, within like a few hours. So th this is Teddy telling us that, uh, you know, he used to work in the government intelligence agency and they're after him now. I didn't get a job with them because I wanted to work for them. The sand had ears, Rita. If Sand has ears, Rita, let's just say it was a good place to get the information that I needed. We're almost done with this SOS here. This is a good opportunity while we're doing kind of a, a rote fetch quest here to talk about how I feel about Discourse in general. I think Discourse is good. I don't think it necessarily is great. Uh, and I think maybe it's, a lot of people are going to consider it a little bit too expensive on a like time value for what it actually offers. But normally what I'd judge games on is whether or not I was engaged while playing them. You know, if I was alt-tabbing like crazy. If I played two hours but I alt-tabbed for, you know, 45 minutes of that. That says to me that I wasn't really that engaged. I, you know, sat down and actually read through all the text. I wasn't skipping it as I am now just to, you know, keep things moving. Uh, and, and I want, as soon as I finished one playthrough, I was like, okay, I could probably do a Let's Look At now. But I want to see what happens to these characters. And I want to make some different decisions and I want to check that out. I don't think as, uh as far as graphic adventures go, that this necessarily achieves the heights of something like a lot of Telltale's recent endeavors. Um, or maybe, I don't know, like, um, oh, what is that game called? The, the ones from the guys who did the Blackwell Prophecy, it was the point-and-click adventure game with kind of like a sci-fi reso resonant? Resonant, that was it. Uh, it. It's not maybe from a story standpoint that engaging, but it's kind of a novel approach in that 
instead of just being something you'll beat once, it's meant to be beaten multiple times, and instead of being kind of like a deep experience, it's more of a wider experience, where you, you try to get multiple outcomes and endings, which is really cool. Um, no one spends that much time alone in a basement without doing something villainous. I could show you something I do alone in my basement. We don't have a basement, this is, we live in an apartment. I guess we share a basement with a lot of other people. We have successfully created an SOS signal on the beach. By the way, don't think that just because I did that, you have now seen everything there is to see from the SOS signal encounter. I deliberately skipped a little bit of more juicy flavor stuff so that you could see it for yourself if you're interested. By my calculations, we should be saved in the next hour or two. Did you spell it right? Are you suggesting that I'm unintelligent, Steve? All right. And we also saw a light off the shore. It was too far to swim, but maybe we could build something like a raft to get out there. Actually, I think we found something by the plane, but we need help getting to it. We didn't have enough people. A lot of that wreckage was too heavy to lift. Um, what about Garrett? I spent most of the day lost. He thought he knew where he was going. We got a little separated. All the plants look the same. Let's get some shut-eye. We can look into it tomorrow. So that's going to be the end of this day. And we could go talk to some people some more, or we could just go to sleep. And I think that's probably where I'm going to end my episode. And in a way, uh, I, I feel a little remiss that we're ending our episode... Uh, with, without showing anything major that can happen to any of these characters, but rest assured there are potential storms, animal attacks, spelunking, mountains to climb, rafts to build, and um, people are going to find themselves in some very dangerous situations. You'll have to find yourself making some very tough decisions about, you know, maybe who lives and who dies as time goes on. Uh, but this is Discourse. I don't think it's necessarily a slam dunk, but I think it's pretty cool, and if you're the kind of person who could see yourself uh, playing this through multiple times, I think you can get your money's worth. Slickly presented, uh, decent writing, looks pretty good. I, I like the way it looks, and um, yeah, like a huge replayability factor. I would go so far as to say that if you don't really see yourself sitting down and playing this twice, it's probably not worth getting, because really, the joy of the game is is seeing the the different kind of branching paths that you can take depending on the actions and the kind of butterfly effects of you know not like seeing how Teddy is impacted on day eight by the fact that you know you let his legs get torn on by those crabs on day one. There are kind of subtle and not so subtle implications and consequences for those decisions that take place throughout the game. So it, take this as like a, a a lukewarm recommendation. If it comes down in price especially, I think this is the kind of thing you could easily have a couple of fun hours uh, with on an afternoon. Uh, but I like it pretty well. For now, there is a link to pick up uh, this course in the video description below if you're interested. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the episode, click the like button and subscribe if you want to see more first impressions like this in the future. But for now, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.